You're listening to 15 Minutes, where we feature community leaders sharing what the rest of us should know but likely don't. Hello, everyone. Michael Renfro here. I'm the host of 15 Minutes, where we talk with top-notch lawyers and law firms about what it takes to grow a successful practice. Uh, This episode is brought to you by Gladiator Law Marketing, where we deliver uh, tailor-made services to help you accomplish your objectives and maximize, maximize your growth potential. To have a successful marketing campaign and truly make sure that you're getting the best ROI possible, your firm needs to simply put, have a better website and better content than the competitors. Uh, at GLM, we, are, we use artificial intelligence as well as uh, machine learning. Combine that with literally over a century now of expert uh, experience to outperform that competition. Uh, and to give you an idea, just, just our founder alone has a quarter century, 25 years. To learn more, go to gladiatorlawmarketing.com. That's spelled standard gladiator, G-L-A-D-I-A-T-O-R. Law, L A W, marketing, M A R K E T I N G dot com to schedule a free marketing consultation. With that said, I'm going to jump right into it. Today's guest is Christina Coleman. Christina Coleman ha- uh, is a immigration attorney uh, in Michigan, I believe, if I'm getting the state right. And uh, one of the things that she's doing, I'll let you tell more about it here right off the bat, kind of an impromptu. But why don't you tell them, just give us an idea of what you told me in the, the email about the transformation that you're making going from from remote control to uh, Coleman. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for having me, Michael. And, and no you. offense to uh, Michigan, but I'm actually in the lovely city of Chicago. Chicago. Um, okay. I'm sorry. I got it wrong. I apologize. No worries. I love Michigan too. Big fan of uh, the it's state. It's your son that's going to Michigan. Never mind. I just. That's I, okay. If we were fart. Michigan residents, he might actually be at Michigan uh, because of the uh, in-state tuition there. But right. he was very lucky and got a wonderful scholarship to Michigan State. So we are proud Spartans now. Um, and uh, yes, I just was telling, we were just talking about how we are unveiling our new name uh, right after Labor Day. We will be ColemanImmigration.com. Congratulations. Uh, so yeah, it's exciting, exciting times. We're celebrating our seventh year and decided it was time for a little, a little refresh. That was, uh, you answered it before I even got, I was about to ask how old is the, is the company total, but you, seven years, just so you know, it's my lucky number. So I, I love seven. Um, it's always been, I, I tend to be with George. If I ever had a little girl, I probably would have named her seven for all kinds of reasons now. So how did you get, how did you get started, Christina? What, uh, what got you? And when I say how you got started, I'm really referring more to, like in law in general, like what got you going from being a pedestrian and a civilian to somebody who knows the rules of the country? (laughs) Wow, I love that analogy. Um, Well, I'll give you the short (laughs) version-ish. I grew up in uh, in Toronto, Canada, which is uh, part of my maybe affinity for Michigan. I feel like there's a lot of of, uh, confluence there. But, um, and I went to, I went to undergrad uh, in, in Canada and did a master's degree in Montreal and then was lucky to get a scholarship to come down and go to Yale to do uh, more graduate work. And that was sort of the beginning of my immigration journey, but I did not plan on becoming a lawyer. I was gonna be a professor of medieval studies. Mm. Uh, And, um, but came out to Chicago for a one year opportunity Kind of fell in love with the city, decided I wanted to stay, was taking a pause <laughs> from my right. dissertation. I'd done everything else and um, just picked up a six month writing gig for an immigration attorney thinking, oh, you know, I just I just need to take a break and um, found it fascinating. And, and it was not what I had imagined at all. Uh, got to work with a lot of fascinating uh, researchers in all areas, writing um, persuasive documentation for them. Six months turned into five years. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? Real quick too, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was crazy. Um, and I thought, you know what? If I'm going to do this, I need to be a lawyer. Like you said, I, I can't, I, I have to, I love school. So I went back to, to school, got my law degree. Again, life's Where'd you get your law degree? Just you no problem. I went to Loyola University here in Chicago. Okay, cool. And, one of the reasons I picked it actually was because they had a wonderful night program that a lot of the schools didn't have at that time. And I had just had a baby uh, and uh, I wanted to, I was going to work 
go to school at night and do the baby. That turned out to be a little more. So I'm assuming this is this is the baby baby boy that's off to Michigan State, right? So we're talking about like 1920, somewhere in that years ago. Exactly 19 years ago. Uh, literally right now, I was saying to myself, "Can I really go to law school with this two month old baby who wow. doesn't sleep through the night?" <laughs> they never do. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and I thought maybe I should defer. Maybe I'll right. defer. And literally. He's, it's like I sent him a message or something. He started sleeping through the night and I thought, okay, we're going to try it. And uh, it. we did it. I did. What do you have uh, to lose? Right. And it was, it was great. And all of my law school friends, I, I, we, of course they all knew Sebastian. That's his name, Sebastian from when I love he that was. Name. I love that name. I, I had just so you know, I had a, a group of friends that were three, one of the most incredible names. I've tried to not name my boys very, very different because of it, but there was three brothers that I knew, and it was uh, Sebastian, um, oh my God, Inman, and Rory. Oh and wow! I, I love. I was like, these are just really, they very not normal. Like Sebastian is probably the one that, if if anything, you can say is kind of similar to Christian. But I think I've only known like one Sebastian, and one of my favorite characters of all time is the Sebastian character. Funny enough, in uh, oh my God, I just. Blade Runner. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Blade oh, Runner, but yeah. the, the Sebastian in that is uh, one of the main characters. And I remember the first time I heard that name, I was like, I love that name. It's so different. So I kudos to the name. I love it. Oops. I actually had, didn't know anybody named Sebastian either until I went to France. And it's a much more common name. I would imagine it's a European, right? Yeah. Is it specific to France? That area? Is that is that the area that it comes from? Um, there's all kinds of St. Sebastians all over Europe and all also Europe. Okay. in South and Central America, he was an important Christian martyr. Uh, I actually named him after I, I met a wonderful Sebastian in France who was fantastic. It's also a very popular name in um, the UK. So it's yeah, it's kind of all over the place. Um, no, but that's cool. But wait, so which I didn't quite understand. Who did you name him after? Which which Sebastian well, was it? Well, it was kind of a Oh, uh, oh, oh, I get it now. A it compiled, was a, a you know, montage I've, of things. Now I get, very okay. aware of yep. the, now I get it. Of the, of the, of the saints, but also met some, some uh, wonderful um, person named Sebastian. And I thought, I really, I really like this name. Yeah, and like um, so I point at him to all my law school friends. And I'm like, look, it's the physical embodiment of our legal career. Like we literally yeah. started law school right at the big, and now he's, he's this uh, giant, individual i he's six feet tall i don't know where he really i was about from. to ask you if he's giant <laughs> I, I would have mesh, imagine mom is now looking up at him right do you remember <laughs> a moment where it went from like this to okay i love you son but you <laughs> I, my mom is i mean i'm i'm six one i ended up being six one when it all was said and done and my mom i think is maybe five nine you know may, maybe I, she might only be five seven honestly and so, you know, it was, it didn't take long for not only myself, but my my two young or my two oldest who are 22, even the short one is looking slightly down at her because he's like 5'10", right? Yeah, it's it's funny. interesting um, when we do all this stuff on Zoom, you know, we have no idea how tall anybody is. Uh, I'm actually a I... little short guy. So <laughs> you know, I, I was standing on a stool and I didn't I didn't want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but yeah, so law school was an amazing, an amazing awesome. time. How long did um, it take you? I know it was going back. So was it like three, four years total or how long did law school take specifically just that part of it? So I did it in four. You can do it in three or if you go full time or some right. of my. That uh, was what I figured rates. stopped you from doing quite frankly. I mean, you have a kid, you have a job. How, it would be a miracle to do it in three years. Yeah. And I actually decided not to keep working because I wanted to spend time with my son. And I will right. tell you what a gift. I was very uh, fortunate decision. to have that. I got to be with him until he was four and went off to school. And I started at a large law firm. And I was very glad that I had taken that time because the next several years I, I was working pretty much grounding nonstop. Yeah, it was pretty intense. Um, and yeah, so I was um, at Sidley Austin for a while, not doing immigration, actually. Uh, I did a lot of, I did a bunch of pro bono immigration work while I was there, but I was actually a litigator while I was there. And then after a while, it's like, okay, 
this is not why you went to law school. It's not your passion. Uh, learned how to be a great lawyer, met some wonderful people who I'm still friends with. Um, but it just, you know, eventually it was like, okay, it wasn't your direction. <laughs> time to go, time to go off and do what you, you set out to do. And we were talking before we got rolling about life's twists and turns. So that was definitely a big moment when I was like, okay, to, to go back uh, to, to why I, why I went to law school in the first place. Since we're, since we're on it, would you say that that particular moment was the biggest turning point or is there one that you would consider bigger in the sense of getting you to where you are now? I think getting me to where I am now, um, probably the most definitive moment was shortly after I opened uh, RC, which stood for Richard Coleman, with um, a friend of mine from law school who'd been practicing immigration the whole time. He was ready to leave his big law firm and uh, said, well, why don't you come with me? Let's open something together. And we did. And then uh, he very unexpectedly and tragically passed away hmm. um, about three or months after we opened. And Just it was three a months. Like, we right. I mean, this is the company. This is the firm that you're running now. We're talking about. Correct. Correct. And wow. Um, that's yeah. Pretty, that's pretty it was very. Uh, that's like <laughs> that's so many feelings wrapped into one when it's a partner, a friend, a new business. I mean, it'd be different if the business was even three years old. Right. Because you'd be past that honeymoon and, and all that. But wow, that's kudos, not kudos for him dying. Obviously, kudos to the fact that you obviously found a way to weather that storm. And that's a hell of a storm. That's a perfect storm, in my opinion. Like the one event put a perfect storm of situations onto you that, you know, obviously you had to handle or, or drown and you're here. Yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. So that's the biggest turning point. What, what'd you learn from that? Just out of that big, that like, what was the one thing you think you took most from that? Well, it was a very interesting moment. Uh, it was definitely a case of building the plane and flying it at the same time. I know that <laughs> can kind of be a tired cliche sometimes, but I really felt that. Um, no, I, I get it. Uh, you know, just having the, I had, a, I had some support and it was interesting. I, we had just hired literally, I think three weeks, uh, a junior attorney, an associate attorney uh, who was a millennial. And I, I liked her very much. <laughs> and I said, what, 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 what do you think? <laughs> what should we do? And uh, I always say when people say, you know, oh, millennials, I say, you know, the great thing about millennials is they always think everything will work out. The, the bad thing about millennials is they always they think, think everything, everything will work, will work out. Yep. So <laughs> in this instance, it was helpful to me because she said, we can do it. You can do it. You, know, you we can do this. And we did. Um, yeah. And she, uh, you know, she was amazing. She stayed with me for two years and then she. Uh, moved on, went out to Colorado, and uh, just, Where I won't I'm say, I, oh, all right, there you go. They just uh, had a baby and bought a nice house in, outside of Denver, um, and she's, you know, she's she's doing her thing, and but she was instrumental, and uh, we, I think, just learning to kind of accept help and move past the fear. I had a lot of anxiety. I'm a single mom. Um, I had a young ish son, son. Was yep. 12 at the time. Um, and you were single cause I, from doing the math, clearly that was the relationship had already been over for a while and you had moved on. So, but Correct. being a single mother, when you put that into the mix of all of it, that just, uh, there's no other adult to help bear the load of, of child raising. Yeah. And going from a big firm salary to starting your business without. You you, you got to love Jerry Maguire. I mean, t I literally wanted to say this like for the last, I mean, you, you, you have one of those, you know, true Jerry Maguire type moments where it's like, you know, first you and your friend, yeah, he died. But then you looked at her like, are we going to do this? Yeah, let's do it. You know, like, <laughs> who cares? You know, I mean, sometimes uh, I, I truly believe sometimes we have to, well, 
it's not even me, obviously, that believes this. This is a cliche, right? The only way I can't remember the entire cliche, but essentially you're never going to find great success if you are not willing to put it all on the line and throw caution to the wind. That is a reality. The, the ones that have the most success in this life were willing to put everything on the line and not worry about the consequences. I mean, so, I worried about it. I was a Yeah, you worried wreck. about it, but you didn't worry <laughs> enough, right? I mean, you, what I mean by that is, yeah, we worry about it. I'm not saying that you, you don't have that. I mean, I guarantee you all these folks worry about it, but we had enough entrepreneurism because I say this, I've done the same thing myself to where you go, you know what? I know I have a family. I know I have all these responsibilities and everybody's going to think I'm crazy, but I also have a feeling and a belief that what I'm doing is the right thing. And I'm just going to do it, you know, and if it turns out wrong, I believe everything happens for a reason. Anyway, if it turns out that it doesn't work out, it still was supposed to happen because you learn something from that and you take it to the next to the next uh, project or the next business, the next firm that you may work for. If you, you know, uh, I mean, I myself have had my own business, sold it, had my own business, failed, had to tuck my tail and go work for someone else for a while. I've been through every you know scenario and, and it's all a learning experience and it all makes you who you are. So. Kudos, though, for truly, um, I always like hearing people that, uh, that take the chance, particularly when I bet everything around you and everybody was like, probably not the best idea. You need to do this, this, and this. You have a son. You have a blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, yeah, but I'm going to go for it. So what challenge did you overcome that gave you actually the most you know, headway on the other side? Kind of like what we talked about before the show. Um, I would say basically that moment of working through the anxiety, working through the fear of failure and with your partner dying. Are you talking about that moment yeah. where you had to literally take the, take, the, just, take the reins and yep. just letting myself, um, you know, move, move through that moment and get past and ex like I said, accept, accept the help from people. I, I still, I won't, I won't uh, pretend I didn't make any fear-based decisions that looking back now, yeah. I can see the mistakes I made uh, on, on occasion. Um, well, I definitely did made the beginner mistake of taking every client, even clients that you know, aren't a good fit for you, or you can tell right away, there's, they're not going to be a great client. You take them anyway, because you're afraid. Uh, I, I want I always tell people like, if you, I know we all do it, but Try not to do it. Know your worth. Uh, it took me a while to, to know my own Believe worth. in your worth. Believe in it, too. Like, don't just know it, but then hold true, you know? Like, stand your ground, if you will. Yeah. So those would be a couple of, of the big ones. Um, I will say as a little uh, aside or not aside, I don't know if we're mainly talking to lawyers, but if you are thinking of forming any kind of partnership or going to have any other people working with you as lawyers uh, make sure you have an operating agreement as immediately the, on the this very a, first day and this i'm, is an I'm, example I'm the cautionary tale it. and i, I had know. one i had an operating agreement oh, wow. and thank god i did because i wouldn't have you been would have to. been effed so yeah. bad yeah uh, and i tried you know i used to do insurance i did insurance for many years and uh, I would try to explain to people, they're like, oh, insurance, insurance salesmen have almost as bad a rap as like car salesmen, right? Which is and ridiculous because you have to, <laughs> and lawyers, yeah, we're all right there. We all, here's the funny thing. We all have to drive almost like almost all of us, right? And anybody that thinks that doesn't need insurance has never understood the concept of what it is and yeah. when the appropriate times to use it or the fact that it's a financial building tool, by the way. Okay. That's the biggest one that I used to teach people, but more importantly on this particular subject, I would tell people, look, if you're starting a business, I don't care if the dude's 20 or if the dude's 90, you don't know what's going to happen the moment you shake his hand and say yes. You have, you have literally liability time between you say yes and even getting the contract because you just don't know what's going to happen. But the shorter amount of time that there is between the handshake, the signing, and the, and the, the, the uh, oh my goodness, you just said it, the Please say the name of it again. My brain just operating agreement. Yes. The operating agreement, you know, the moment that you have that in place, then, then you're covered, but you really, you know, you're, you're taking a chance the moment that you sign an agreement and don't have that, right? Like that's already yeah. a chance and people just don't understand how 
I mean, you, you kind of got lucky in the sense of it was only three months, right? Three months in? Three so, and a half. Three and a half. I mean, and when I say lucky, you clearly had already done that, like you said. But I bet had it been three days in, it might not have been done, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, I spoke with people and they they did recommend it. And I, I had to push to get it done because my partner, one of the great things about him was that he was a risk taker. And right. I still, I still sometimes say, well, what would he do in this situation? Right. But um, I said, oh, you know, I think, I think we really need to do this. And without going into the details, I'm so glad I did because there was actually a person who had been sort of related to him who said, well, now you have to close the firm. And I said, no, no, I won't. Uh, here's the operating agreement. Here's how it's going to happen. So, nice. <laughs> I love that. Like so that, that's that, that was... moment that we all love in films. Like, no, that's not going to happen. Sorry. It's right, <laughs> it's right here. Maybe you want to read the lines and see the signature. Yeah. I love that. So um, let's talk about that for a minute. So two, uh, a, kind of a, a dual part question. Number one, what's your, what's your proudest moment? And I'm going to ask you this other one, just cause I, you know, I want to try to shorten up time for both of us, but what's your proudest moment? And then what's the best advice from uh, a mentor or if you have multiples that you want to say that's more than that's more than welcome, but proudest moment and then best advice from a mentor. So proudest professional moment, I would say, is probably just today, like every every day we get a little a little further, a little stronger. I do remember it's because you're on my show. That's this is the (laughs) highlight of my professional career, Michael. You've you've you've. Your witness. Um, <laughs> Thank you for having a sense of humor, by the way. I appreciate it. Um, I do remember. No, I get saying, it. Every day, every day is the is the is the better day. Like every day, it gets better and it continues. I I feel the same way because I'm living the dream. Continue. I was just going to say. I remember passing those milestones like one year, and, and like you know, most ninety percent of businesses fail within their first yep. year. Then you know, three years. You know, well, you've got about you know fifty, and they need a five, and so you know, I. I like to just always feel that I'm moving forward and, you know, getting to, to mentor. I do have a, a junior, well, she's not junior, an associate attorney, a newer attorney on staff with me. So getting to work with her and, and just feeling like we are moving in a great direction. We have most of our clients are fantastic. And like I said, being able to get to that point where, you know, you know, there's people who maybe need a different kind of lawyer or maybe are in a different area than what you, you pick do. pick and choose what you know is best for the firm and best for the client. You don't, I get it. Like that's, it takes, a, it. it's not easy to get to that point, like you said, when you're trying to overcome all the fear and will I make it my first year? Will I make it three years? Like you said, you know, it's, it's so, it, it takes a lot. I, I really do understand that. We, we are similar in that approach that we don't, because what here's, what here, you know, I'll just say this. I want to expand on it because I don't know if you were going to say anything about this fact of it, but a lot of people think it's about the money. Ultimately, it ends up coming down to if you make that bad decision out of fear, you end up costing your business more time and more money than had you just let them go and talk to the next person, which most likely would have been a better fit in some way, shape or form. So you end up hurting, not just pausing, but it's that two steps back to go three steps forward now. Because you have to go, you got to go back and then you're going to learn. So it's going to be a forward movement, but it's a forward movement with, with backlash, you know? Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, so that's, that's probably my hugest thing that I've learned or hugest, I don't think that's the word, the biggest thing that I've learned. We can, we can talk however you want. I'm fine with it. (laughs) Lawyers have legalese. So y'all can just make up words sometimes and we don't even know if you did. So don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and then you had asked about, Mentor. about mentors. I know you're I think, one now. I know that's kind of cool from you. You were just talking about, you're kind of now one of, you know, you're a mentor to a few different people throughout time, but who's, who's the one that gave you the best piece of advice? So I think the best piece of advice probably came from my wonderful friend and law school colleague and fellow immigration attorney, who's in a different area of immigration law than I am. And I'll give her a little shout out here. Her name is Kathleen Venucci. Uh, Say she's, that one more time, please. Kathleen, her name is Kathleen. Kath, Kathleen. She goes by Katie, but okay. uh, Venucci. And Venucci. she's at um, she's at Algren Law, and she's wonderful for um, 
all the things I don't do, asylum, <laughs> deportation, uh, right. complex family matters with criminal elements for immigration. Ooh, um, that's a big one. I would have, I've never, that's like three practice areas. I never even thought about that from a marketing standpoint. Like, I don't think about someone that has a criminal situation with a group of people that's, I mean, like, that's just, I never would have thought of it. That's funny. Criminal family and, and uh, immigration all thrown into one. Yeah, well, so it's it's it all has the impact immigration. So she just does immigration, just like me. So right, we but are, if it impacts the immigration, then she has yeah. to understand the ins and outs of family as well as criminal to yeah. get through. That's that's just I, I I know it sounds dumb. I've been doing this since two thousand seven, as far as specific to attorneys, and I'm just never like you. Still hear new things where you're like, wow, you actually you know you either have to know that, or I imagine maybe get a sub counsel or additional counsel to help you in those matters that gives you the expertise that you need, but still just never thought of it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, people are like, you just do immigration. I'm like, I don't even do all immigration. Immigration is intense and complex yeah. and changing. When I started doing this in, I won't every say year, what year, six but months. Uh, a long time ago, 20 years ago, when I started, you know, we had some, we had a sheet up on the wall with like where you file things and like this and, that. and now it's like every every time I file anything I have to double check they're constantly changing they're constantly changing like policies the last administration was crazy for this so it there's a lot like the of IRS I mean it really I'd is. say it's worse it's well I was more. gonna say I think yeah. six months I, I just fluid. said it. I think every six yeah. months you've got new things on the table that reassess like almost in in inevitably at least one thing is going to change somehow your routine in at least one case scenario and you're like wow man come on i just got yeah. that one down <laughs> <laughs> so she was so so katie was there she was also a friend of my uh partners and she said you know christina you you've got this and we are all here for you we we will help you you know she's football analogy i don't know much about football but something about I was carrying the ball, but there were people around me. I don't know, something, something sports related, but right. um, she was very encouraging. And I will say the immigration uh, community uh, in Chicago, anyway, are very collaborative, very supportive. Um, I definitely have, you know, I, you can reach out to people and, um, and they'll, tell you, they'll, they'll help, back. they'll help you. They'll help yeah. you. I was, you know, immigration attorneys. Yeah. At least, at least the ones I know. I mean, I'm sure they're, right. yeah. So that's There's always that sharks was, in the water, but it sounds like you guys have a lot more dolphins than sharks there. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> yeah, it certainly attracts a certain type of person, I would say. And and then just overall being a lawyer, I would say my mentor at Sidley Austin, a wonderful person who I'm still good friends with. And um, she just taught me that you, you know, you don't need to be confrontational or belligerent to be a, an effective lawyer. She's really fantastic at what she does. Uh, she actually runs the Chicago office of Tucker and Ellis um, now, and she's wonderful. Uh, she's so good at what she does. And I just, I just, I loved, you know, watching her lead a team by just the way she, she handled other attorneys. And, and you, you, you learn sometimes negative examples and you're like, okay, I'm just not going to do whatever they do. I'm right. not doing that. <laughs> and there, you know, obviously those are everywhere, but you know, those, those were definitely um, great great mentors for me. And then I just have to give a shout out to my parents, of course, because they just oh, always believe, awesome. believed in me. And, um, you know, they're just like, whatever you want to do, Christine, you can put your mind to it. So those, those were, that was important support at that time. And just, you know, just make your own family, make your own, uh, support network. That's you, create really your, you create your, your surroundings, you know, and it's funny because, uh, I had my time in AA and NA and CA. And one of the things that uh, happens when you go through those, and this was back in my teens, believe it or not, I wasn't even 20 when I went through all that. I was 16. Um, and uh, one of the things, though, that, that is the predominant driving force that I've taken with me since then uh, is that when you want to change something, you've got to change your playground and your playmate. And if you want to be successful, if you want to be positive, if you want those things, then you put yourself around other positive, optimistic, successful people. And really osmosis is a real thing between humans in the sense that if you continue to put yourself around that and observe it, and obviously you, there has to be a part of you that tries to practice it, right? You can't just observe it, but it will become second nature before you know it. It will not be something you're trying to practice. 
it'll be something you start to preach and are practicing your actions, prove it to people. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's very true. And having just wonderful lawyers. I mean, and I know sometimes lawyers take some, some, uh, flack for oh, but, so uh, salespeople, <laughs> but and we're, been... we're very much the same lawyers and salespeople. I, I, I always say this, it doesn't even matter if you're not a litigator because everybody thinks it's always just immediately the fact that, uh, litigators and salesmen are obviously very similar. You cannot argue it. You're trying to sell and persuade a group of people to see it your way, period. That's what a salesman is. But there's more to it than that. Like uh, just for instance, your immigration, anything that any salesman, or I should say anything that any good salesman, salesperson, let me be uh, politically correct here. So I'm making it <laughs> truly uh, broadband. I'm just I'm 50, so the man still stays in there. But any salesperson that truly wants to be successful has to learn their, their service, their product, whatever it is they're selling, the same way that you folks have to learn every particular case. The only difference is we don't have to go to school for seven years to learn how to do that. And I do mean that. I'm not putting it down. You have legal books and so part of the job for an attorney is that when they get a case, they have to go back and reference these books. And I think a lot of what you go to school for is learning how to do that properly to get the case knowledge that you need to fight the case that you're in until you have your own base of case knowledge that you can rely on, right? So a lot of what you learn, I think, in, in that uh, as being a lawyer is that. But the other part, though, I, I, I mean it very seriously, the only way you can truly persuade and convince a, another party or a group of people of anything or teach them about it, which is more what you do because you really teach these folks and then run them through the process. I'm guessing that's most of what you do and not a lot of in, in court work. Is that right? I actually do no in court work. Uh, no one of the court. reasons I uh, focus on my area is that I had no right, you desire don't have to, to go back to court. Yeah, no, I get it. Um, we, but it is a we, lot of teaching for you, right? Like you're teaching these folks almost from day one many times, almost everything that the process takes for them in their particular case. Sure. Yeah. You're, you're explaining to clients and then um, we do everything, what we say on the papers, like everything is in writing and you're persuading an officer, you know, why this person has extraordinary ability or why they are an amazing manager and should be able to, to get their green card. Well, and here's the one say, one thing I'll, I'll always fall back on too, and the similarities. You have to sell those folks when they first reach out to your firm. They have to be sold by you that you are the one. I, it doesn't matter whether it was you individually, but you know whether it was your marketing, something had to get them to call you or pick up the phone, referral, right? Whatever it is. And then you really do have to close the deal. I say that because I do work with attorneys and they literally call it that. Most attorneys I talk to are like, I close this many deals. They don't even call it cases when they're talking to me on the other end if that makes sense, when it's, when it's marketing conversation and not the legal conversation. So I just find it, uh, I've always found it very similar. I think that's why I took to it so much because I feel like I'm dealing with most of the time my own breed of person, if you will. They get my, under, you know, they understand the, the, the ins and outs of it, right? Like you probably need to talk to, I'm guessing, just my guess, but probably somewhere between three to five in order to get a case that you feel is good and a case that they say yes as well. Not only do you like, but they like you. That probably takes maybe three to five calls on average, I'm guessing. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think one of the things about for a lot of lawyers, and this may be changing, but for me, the, the business of law was not, I wasn't, it's hard for me to it took me a long time to be able to see this as a business and I didn't want to worry about money and I didn't want to think of it, mm -hmm. like you said, as, as, you know, closing that always be closing and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, I just want to help people. And if people want, you know, um, and generally that's kind of still how I run it a little bit. Um, but you do obviously have to think about, about what works. And in a lot of ways, I am my product. I'm, I'm the brand and, I spend a lot of my time talking on the phone to my clients because they just, yep. you know, they just want to talk to you about, I, I say, I put, my I, I put my therapist hat on and man, during the pandemic, I would say I was more than 50% therapist, wow. like yeah, it's going to be imagine. okay. 
we're going to get there. Everybody's in the same boat. All the other embassies are closed. I know this is frustrating. Try not to worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting blend of sort of, like you said, entrepreneurial and thinking of it as a business. But it's such a human component for me anyway, like every person. A lot of them, this is their dream. Right. Oh, this, this is their, their the this is their, or it's not the their beginning life of goal. their dream. Yeah. Right. They they have somewhere they want to go and I can get them there. And so and 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 it's interesting, like the different ways people are and business versus family cases. And um anyway, it's uh yeah, it's a it's an interesting, interesting uh sort of way to think about, you know, how you're thinking about yourself in terms of your business and the things you have to do and the things you want to do. Well, I, I, I truly hope that, uh, that nothing I said was, was taken, uh, you know, the wrong way. Cause I don't, I don't mean to make a comparison that may hurt someone's feelings or feel like I was downing them. I really see it that way because, uh, like for instance, um, my evolution, uh, in sales was in the beginning, obviously only, I mean, when, you know, I started as early as 14 and that was all about money. It was purely about money and it only got more about money until, uh, I held my first child. You know, so until I would turn 28 and my priorities were flipped upside down and I had a new understanding of what life meant, the, the sales was always about money, money, money. Like you said, you know, always be closing. And uh, I told you it's a, it's an evolution. And, you know, now we, I turn away more folks now because I really look for the right fit. I look for someone I can truly help and is going to be kind to my project managers in the company. We only have 50, oh my gosh. 52, 53 clients. I have one guy that we has made my project manager cry. And that just like, you, there's no reason in business to make anybody cry, in my opinion. There's no right? crying in marketing. Right, there's no crying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a Tom Hanks moment the other day, but I won't discuss it. Um, uh, from that movie, funny enough. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like truly what you learn, uh, and here's my philosophy on it. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's persuasion and there's manipulation, right? These two, two, these two words are nearly identical in definition, okay? Mm -hmm. But one is what I call me manipulation because it's all about you and what you're trying to get and gain. And then there's people suasion where you're trying to help the other person because what you're doing and what, they, what you offer, whether it's a sale or a friendship, or a lending hand, whatever you offer will help them in some way, and you're trying to show them. So I went from, you know, this needle, I mean, and there's some people that are right in between, right? You know, what some a lot of what they do is, is for themselves, and they, they justify it by doing it for other people. Well, you can't take away they're doing it for other people. But the reason, and I always tell people, I'm like, you know, you really got to look at the reason, what are you doing this for? That'll tell you whether you're doing it, you know, for the people, or whether you're doing it for yourself. That's it's just that simple. What's the end goal? A lot of people don't like to look at their end goals either because they always say money. Haven't you ever noticed that's always money? But then if you ask them like three questions beyond that, my mother-in-law is moving in and there's no way I want to see her anymore. And I need 10 extra thousand dollars to build a room onto this house. So I do not <laughs> see that woman. Speaking from the heart there, Michael? No, no, no. <laughs> my mom lives with me. That's my, I got my mom in the house. My mother-in-law is a horrible person. Uh, not, not the real one, actually. I'll just say that. My wife is adopted. Her adopted mother is literally mommy dearest. I'm not even exaggerating. Down to wire hangers, oh, literally. Wow. Her real mother, she just met. Uh, well, honestly, her real mother's passed. Her real father's passed. Um, she just found her real family. So she's now talking to her blood brother in Hungary. Uh, she's Hungarian, mm -hmm. uh, predominantly European, but Asian, African, and, and many other gypsies. So like many of us, right? A mutt, but uh, she's now found her real family. So actually on a side note, it's kind of cool. It's not, it really is. I, I, it is a example that I take from a phone call that I did in 2005, no, four, five, 2005, uh, February. I even remember the month because I started working for a company that sold uh, IT training software. Have you ever heard of like these folks that get certified with Microsoft and CompTIA and, and Cisco, right? Mm -hmm. I would sell the training and did that for many, many years. And, and I would sell the training for this and um, this particular company. Uh, I had just transferred over because they knew 
how good I was, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to get into that. And uh, they were talking about pulling the pain. I was like, oh, dude, I'll pull pain. Watch me on the phone. Because money is never the pain. It's always, money is a symptom that will, you know, of the, of the pain, if you will. I need that money because I'll be able to fix this problem down here. Always the case. So, and I got on the phone with this guy. And he, he nearly started crying. I'm like, dude, I'm sorry, man. But if you get the training, you can get that certification. <laughs> You're going to make yourself $10,000 more a year, like literally just by getting that cert, man. So you can rest assured that uh, he did buy the training and, and he got his, uh, he got his training. He got his certification and came back and got more training from me um, before uh, seven months was up. So it really works if you put it to use, right? Just training and then going out and taking a test. Awesome. It was cool. Have I lost you? It looks like you're frozen. No, I'm here. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just listening. Yeah, I, I, I know I went off a tangent. I'll, I I'll keep, make it It's quick. okay. And I also think I've been looking at the wrong camera the whole time, so I'm trying to figure out. Have you been, I, I have two cameras. I have one that is the camera, and then I have another one that doesn't have the, the vibration shakes either. It doesn't have that. And I that one, though, is not hooked up to this. It's too confusing. You don't want to hear it. <laughs> no worries. So I was just kind of. I was listening, but I was like, am I looking at him in the eye or am I looking at him in the eye now? I can't figure it out. Anyway. No, um, cool. What's the craziest thing you've ever done? Craziest thing. Well, it was interesting. I was, uh, not my son being 19. Um, when I was 20, I left uh, and I went and I moved to France and I had no phone mm. and no phone in the apartment, no phone at all. And didn't know where I was living. I'd never been to where I was going. And my, I was thinking of it about it as, as a parent. And I thought my parents just let me go. And they didn't know where I was going. They didn't know the people I was going to be living with, know anything about anything. And I thought, wow, I don't know if I would have been as cool <laughs> letting my son traipse off. It was a different time for sure. But looking back Times on it. Change. Yeah, it definitely, like, looking back now, at the time, it didn't seem crazy. It was like, what's no, the problem? No, at the time, it was 100% acceptable. Yeah, and then I, uh, I did and it again. And then Taken actually. came out. <laughs> right? And then what came out? I said, and then Taken came out. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> right? No, my mom, I mean, mom, that really well, was a wake-up call to a lot of people of what goes on in this world, in the yeah. sense that, you know, for every great guy, like we talked about earlier, that also means that there's an equal to the balance, and there's a really horrible dude or group of dudes for that matter that are doing, you know, horrible, bad things. I would, I would be definitely afraid. I I'm right there with you. Like the things that I did, I don't know how close we are, but I was born in 72. And so like, you know, we were riding bikes around a large neighborhood by the time I was five years old, like far from home in the sense that I would ride my bike to the bike to the other side of the neighborhood. That's more than a mile. Like we're, you know, that's how much it was. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it was a different, but at the same time, everybody knew everybody in that neighborhood all the way down the stretch of the road that I did. We all, they all worked at the same uh, plant. You know, it yeah. was uh, uh, Eastman, Eastman Kodak back then. Uh, now it's just Eastman, but back then it was Eastman Kodak. And like, that's one of those big company plants. Like they, they would have big parties. Everybody knew everybody. So they felt different about letting their kids run a neighborhood where every kid was a kid, most likely of an Eastman employee. Yeah. Whether they were blue or white collar, didn't matter. Yeah, it just definitely, definitely feels odd to me that, yeah, not odd, but I was like, oh, I don't know if I'd be that cool. Um, I've also, well, you know, I did, I did go skydiving one time and I'm That's glad awesome. I did it, but I would never, I, I would never do it again. You, you know, we did the tandem jump. Right. So we went the full the height. 25. What, yeah, 18, 25? We, I think it was 25. 25. Um, wow. And it was really cool, uh, but I'll never do that again. And then I also <laughs> went I'll scuba never diving. <laughs> I've been scuba diving where we went like by sharks That's awesome. and stuff. And that I would do again. because Actually, I've done that. I, I did it for quite a while, maybe. Did you feel very confident with the gear in the sense of like, you know, because my, my whole thing is breathing. It's one of my fears. I won't deny it. Like, of drowning losing breath like that's one of the ones you know that I'm, i don't want to go out like that just give me a give me something to the head make it quick or let me die <laughs> in my sleep right but i definitely don't want to suffocate drown or burn like those three are so like how does it feel how 
comfortable would you say you felt even in the first, like the first moment you put that thing in your mouth and was breathing through that versus breathing, you know, traditional? I was incredibly comfortable. I will say that I did not do a resort certification and I don't recommend them. I would do a full on like in Chicago. Do a I, class somewhere I did a proper class. Gotcha. So I really knew, felt like I knew what I was doing. We felt were better educated that way. Yeah. And I felt very comfortable. I'm a, I was a lifeguard. I'm a very comfortable swimmer. I felt. Um, and so I, and we did our open, we call it open water in Thailand, which was amazing. Oh, that's awesome. And did How a bunch of water? Uh, crystal. And it was like a shipwreck and we saw all kinds of amazing animals. And I probably did a dozen dives uh, here and there, Turks and Caicos, Jamaica. And At that's the something. Just out of curiosity, like what, what age, sorry to come back to it, but what, what age do you think the ship was? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. Roundabouts, it was, century wise. It, it was probably an early 1800s. So. Oh, wow. So definitely yeah. pre 19. Yeah, it that's, was older. Oh, that's it was cool. older. Did you go down and really look at it, like swim around? So we the we and- we did like so. There's they call them overheads, and you have to uh-huh. be specially certified. I was not certified for over, overheads at that point, so we just right. swam around and we did like one little tiny. You could probably go enough. back now, though, right? Like if you did it again, you'd probably have the ability maybe to go further. Could you do it? Yeah, I, I I can't remember. So that was I mean, you know, this was a long time ago. This was actually 2001 that I did that particular that we started diving and um yeah i'd have to i'd have to go but i have no idea a lot of these wrecks have been over like over visited i guess and they're not necessarily oh, so the safe regulations stuff change anymore. with how they don't want I, I imagine that with every i know it sounds just gross and disgusting but with every new swimmer brings new debris and dirt and your clear water starts to become not so not so clear right? yeah and i never uh, I never haven't been back. Um, I said Thailand. I'm sorry. I meant Bali. It was Bali, not Thailand. I went to Thailand. Still beautiful. Also Still beautiful. Obviously, you've amazing, been there. You wouldn't but... have mistaken like, yeah, Thailand. I've never been there, but I. <laughs> <laughs> I have been there. I didn't dive. No, that's there, what I'm saying. I, it was very I firmly, cool. I firmly know that you've been to Thailand. Like, <laughs> uh, I myself, I've only been to Mexico, so I, I haven't really been outside this. That's country some great, yet. great I, diving I, there too. Oh, I, oh, I can imagine. My mom told me that uh, she's done it down in uh, Cancun. Now, she did snorkeling, obviously not um, diving, which is a bit of a different experience. But still, she said that that was a lot. Um, just real quick, how, where did you grow up and, and what, it was, what was it like uh, growing up? There? So I grew up in Toronto in Canada. That's right. Uh, that's what was okay. it like then? Because that's something that I have no idea. Like, how different truly is it from American american ways or whatever you want to call us um well it's interesting so toronto when i was growing up in in the 80s there it was not the toronto it is today uh, people are like oh it's so international it's so huge and it, right. it wasn't really it like was that in, in the 80s it was growing it was quiet it was a little quieter i mean it was still the biggest city in canada for sure but we had, I had a similar experience to you in a lot of ways. I could ride my bike as far as I could get. And my parents didn't worry about it. You right. knew everybody in your neighborhood. Um, you know, I, I would say the cultural differences are not enormous uh, between certainly the Midwest and Toronto. I will say that when I was at Yale, I thought, oh, you know, it's nice out here, but these people are a little tightly wound. I liked New York, but I could never live there. Uh, and I, I thought I would leave. I, I said, oh, after this is done, I will go back to Canada. And then when I came out to Chicago, I thought, oh, I could live here. You know, there's a lot of similarities. People a little more chill, a little more kind of just. Even the weather is uh, more similar there in consideration. Very similar weather. Yeah. yeah. So I love Toronto. My parents, all lake. my family still lives in Canada. I still go up there, uh, you know, relatively frequently. I'll, I still have friends there. And who, you know, who knows what the future may hold as, right. as we, were, we were talking about. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it was a wonderful place to grow up. I had a wonderful childhood. I have lovely, lovely parents and a great family. So I was very lucky. I love, I love the continual mention of your parents. So I'm assuming that both of them are currently still around right now, still with us? Yes, they're actually moving from a, the, they had a big, they, after it became clear, my brother and I were not going to move back to Toronto. They 
moved out to the country, 50 oh, cool. acres, big house, but they're actually moving into the little town near where they live. So we've oh. been a, a lot of, uh, you know, the down, the, the, a bit of a downsize. So I've been doing a lot of going through old stuff and lots of childhood yep. things and stuff. So it's been. So there's been a few tears, nostalgic moments that you just didn't know were going to happen until you, oh God. Oh. I, I, wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't say I cried, but my mom almost cried though. Cause she's like, look at all this stuff. How are we going to get rid of it? <laughs> that might so be, that might that's be. That's more, more the tears. overwhelming tears. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God. But, uh, I get it. I get it. It's yeah. funny uh, though. I, I share something else in common with you because um, I grew up, um, I grew up in South Carolina, but by the time I was around, uh, 12, my mom moved to just outside of Atlanta and Atlanta back in 84 was not the Atlanta it is today. Like, I mean, it was really very, I mean, it's like very, very similar, you know, back in 84, Atlanta had one tall building, just one. And that's the peach tree Plaza. The, mm -hmm. at the time, I don't believe at all. It is anymore, but at the time when they built it, it was the tallest hotel, uh, at least in the country. And I think in the world, right. Now it's not only the not not the tallest hotel in the world. It's not even the tallest building in Atlanta. It's not the only building. It's like <laughs> they've got skyscrapers all over the place, and they're constantly going up. That city is by '96, 14 years later, they had the Olympics. You know, so it it went from being like this. I'll give you a for instance. When I first moved in there, um, and this was this was after. So when I moved into Atlanta, I was 16. 17, 17. So that's 1989 when I moved in. The population sign on Peachtree Road read 2.4. When I left in uh, 99, or technically, technically 2000, it was February 2000. Uh, but the last time I saw the sign and went downtown was in 99, and it read 5.2. Oh, wow. That's in just basically 10 years. Yeah, I had a case in Atlanta, probably the like 2009, 2010, and I was down there and it was happening. <laughs> There's a lot going on it in Atlanta. A, that city is, uh, I remember watching it going from, a, you know, just like I say, a regular city to being no different than New York, LA, Dallas, Houston. It's one, Atlanta, you know, Denver. Right? Atlanta, it's 24 hours. Like I used to go to two of the original first 24 hour clubs, Club Anytime and Backstreets. Those were the two clubs, the first two clubs. And you know how they did it? Because you're talking about a, a, a city that's in the middle of the Bible Belt, right? So they did it by uh, the regulations allowed that if you did a, a private club versus a bar, you could stay open okay. 24 hours a day. So they charge everybody a dollar. <laughs> for a year's membership a year's membership oh no that's awesome and you're like uh yeah i have no problem paying you a dollar to get in here for the rest of the year so yeah i mean and it was just after that it was open 24 hours a day both of them and they had you know it was cool they had different nights and all that stuff funny funny to watch the cities grow the way that they do so uh we already talked about colleagues a little bit so let me ask you what's your what's your favorite podcast so that is a good question, but I'm going to answer a different question only because I, I have had a couple of podcasts that I've enjoyed, but in general, I tend to lean towards um, audiobooks is what I listen to. And I, right. I, I was a bit of a snob about audiobooks initially. I thought, oh no, you need to hold the book. You need to feel the pages, you know, former right. academic, recovering academic. I thought, oh no, 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 no. And then I don't know, somewhat friend of mine. Uh, strap the headphone on you <laughs> yeah basically and now i'm i'm an addict so i do listen to the odd podcast i had a couple uh i really enjoyed um some of the sort of like documentary series on a podcast like um the dropout which was a while ago about elizabeth um uh, about theranos and um serial i really enjoyed the first season of that and i always listen to uh you know i listen to some of my favorite radio shows as they're delivered but they're not really podcasts but books I'm listening to a book all the time on audio, That's on audio books. And I, I've, I've, uh, because I'm very busy and I, but I really enjoy, um, having something to listen to the stories that just kind of 
I do all mainly all fiction um, that I listen to, but I'm listening to like a real blend of old and, and new. And yeah, but see, that kind of some... gives me an idea, maybe going back because I never really thought about. Um, I even you know making fun of the Seinfeld episode. I've, I've thought about before, but listening to somebody talk about it the way that you're talking about it because my biggest thing is I don't have time to read. But if you put it on audio, then I can drive and read. I can work and read. I can, you know, there's obviously there's something I can't work and read, but many, many, you know, uh, mundane tasks. Uh, That's exactly. And read. That's exactly. I clean. I do the dishes. I do the laundry. I'm the dish. All that stuff. I, I read always. a new book. Like if you never have, read 20,000 yeah. 20, leagues into the sea, you're like, boom. I, I just finally read that stuff. I finally, I finally read Anna Karenina. I finally read, <laughs> you know, I was like, and it's all about the narrator. Just take one of the free samples, listen to five minutes. Some of the narrators I couldn't, I can't, I can't do. So you have to make sure. No, you like you, the, you like so the that's where you end up. Ha- it's not the author so much as your favorite narrator. And you look for, I imagine other books by that narrator. I love Marin Ireland. She's a fantastic narrator. And um, I just, I've listened to several Which books. means they have to be her. an incredibly good reader. Like they, these have got to be uh, some great readers. Like in the sense that they yeah. don't, and if they do make a mistake, you're never hearing it, obviously, for the final cut. But yeah, yeah. that would be that, that'd be cool. But if you'd so, asked me uh, ten years ago, I'd say, "Oh, books on tape? No, that's for no, no." So yeah, no, I, I believe me. There's a few things like that in my life right now. I won't bother telling you all of them. But there's some things that if you'd asked me about just even two years ago, I'd be like, "Are you kidding? <laughs> we never use that." That's come on, that stuff. And, and these, some of these things have been around for twenty years. I just decided that the I always have that attitude many times that if it's really, really popular and everybody does it, then it has to suck. I know. (laughs) But that's part of my growth that I finally am coming out of that. Like, hey, you know, you might actually like a lot of the things that a lot of people like. It's not not a bad thing. I strive so hard at being different that, you know, you sometimes lose out on some of the things that are enjoyable to all of us. Uh, Any particular conferences um, that you that you like over any others? Uh, Because I know immigration has a different different blend of. um, outings, if you will, and get togethers for what you folks do. So really for immigration, you know, there's local conferences, but it's really all done through the American Immigration Lawyers Association, at least as far as I know, and the Federal Bar Association has some also. I just went to the big annual conference, which we hadn't had for a few years, which was in New York in June. It was fabulous. I saw lots of friends, generally enjoyed myself in New York, although I wish I hadn't been directed that the uh, hotel, the conference hotel was Times Square because it actually was Javits Center and I did not need to stay in Times Square, which (laughs) nobody should ever stay in Times Square. Um, But it was wonderful. You know, it's really just connecting with people. I feel like the live, the network, you know, having not had it for a couple of years and then having it again, you realize how much. And just seeing people, like it was all happening. I didn't think about that though. I didn't, I, you know, obviously yeah. we all thought about not being in court, not seeing your friends and your and your uh, colleagues at work. But I didn't think about the lack of conferences. It never really dawned on me until just now about because that was a time for most attorneys that, if nothing else, I can look forward to this one time of the year where cases are put on hold, and I can focus on other friends, other colleagues, and other people doing the same thing I'm doing for you know a week or two, whatever it is. Yeah, and just running into people like unplanned uh meetings with and and so it was really very with new and old right i mean because yeah, every, sure. every conference you're going to meet a few new faces that you're like ah, hey maybe this was the reason i came this year was to meet you <laughs> no that's cool would you name a favorite tool and or software and and again it can be one of the same but something that you probably let's just put this like like name something that you couldn't live without So I am a recent convert to Dragon, which is an automation software, a dictation software. I'm familiar. I'm a terrible typist. When I was growing up in the 80s, I was told if I was going to be a professional, I would have a a secretary. (laughs) I didn't need to learn how to type. I was going to, I was going to. You were so bad. People are telling you, just get a secretary. (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, people said, you don't need to learn how to type because I was at a sort of high level, high achiever academic school. I get and it, it was like, no, 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 you won't need to learn how, you don't need to know how to type. And then I'm like, oh, I really wish I'd learned how to type. And I also have some issues, dexterity issues with my hands. So Dragon is awesome. And actually yes. I'm just about to put it on my other computer as well. This, I tried it maybe five years ago and it 
still pretty glitchy, but in the last couple of years, it's really upped its game. Uh, the only thing I don't like their technology of is that much as their headphones aren't that great, but. But you can replace those, right? You don't, they're not required to have the headphones. It's just the mic is required from them, correct? The mic that you use. Yeah, I need, they don't break them apart. So I, I just think, sit can't there you get and I a hold standard, it. No, but I, do they not look on their website? Because I think they sell just a standalone mic or there is one that will work with the software. That's what, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm going to, I'm going to do that because just this morning, I actually have two. I have a Bluetooth one and a plug-in one and I wind up just holding them, <laughs> so, right, like, but it's, it's like, fine. Like it's, microphones, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's great. Especially if I'm tired, I can just sit down and, and dictate because I am Emails, emails, emails. I could, it's all emails. It's My not day. the same thing. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I, the volume of emails is quite astronomical. I've been, I've been doing a lot of things and I have a lot of projects. And I, if, if you can't tell, I obviously have an entrepreneur um, spirit in me. And that's just part of you know, who I am. And uh, one of the things that I have really, it's funny you talk about that, but I mean, like just over the last four months, you'll, you'll understand why I'm telling you, have extremely gravitated to uh talk to text i'm like i don't even want to i don't want to type another text out at this point now because the technology has gotten to the point where even if it misses a couple words i'm usually typo in a few words anyway so what the hell does it matter right they're gonna <laughs> yeah. know that i meant give instead of good due to context of the of the you know even though it, it comes out that way so anyway yeah I, it's very similar because it's such a time saver for me to do that rather than try to, and I mean, I've gotten fast. I almost feel like uh, Rob Lowe on uh, Parks and Rec, like, you know, <laughs> but, but why bother if, because I, I'll never do it as fast as I can talk. Yeah. You know, so yeah, that's, that's funny. I tried them a few years back. I bet you that a lot of what has to do is that they've, they've learned a lot between Apple and Google um, doing voice to text. Mm -hmm. and, and really learned how to fine tune that because it used to be a lot of commands that you had to give. And that was one of the things that I loved about uh, Apple's talk to text and, and Google's both of them is the intuitive. I, I don't have to give like the only command I give is punctuation at the end of a sentence or in the middle, you know, a comma. That's, that's the only I don't even have to the or, or paragraph uh, paragraph break. Excuse me. That's it. You know, punctu punctuation paragraph and, and page break that's really the only commands that i have to really use unless i'm copying and pasting i'm not talking about those i'm just talking about you know as you're going off and da, 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 da. so yeah. I, I it i'm sure you remember before it used to be a lot heavier just five years ago it was a lot heavier in trying to get a whole sentence you're like i gotta say all that that takes yeah. the flow out of what i'm saying part of the beauty of it is that you you get into a flow Yes, yes. And I've, I've been impressed. It's much better than it was. It's still, you know, obviously always room for improvement, but always. Um, and there'll be an uh, update in three days. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's been it's been great. Well, this has been great, too. I really appreciate you coming aboard. I know we, we talked longer. We'll cut some of it down, uh, obviously, but uh, I really appreciate you being on. Maybe we can uh, reach out in a year or so and, and um, do like a come back around and, and see how the new firm, since it's literally launching here in days, uh, see how the new name is taking, because it's not really a new firm so much as a new look and a new brand. Let's call it that, right? Yeah, exactly. That would be wonderful. And it's great to be here and announce and also getting to know you a little better. I really, Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a really pleasure on my end. Terrific. Well, have a wonderful day. I will. And I, I, when I say this, I mean it. I truly believe everything else for a reason. Uh, when the meetings, when these cancel out or somebody doesn't show, it's because we weren't supposed to meet. So I know that when they do, we were supposed to meet and, and it's a new connection and who knows what, where it will take us over the next 10 years. I say that because you really never know anymore what's going to happen after you meet somebody, right? For sure. Have a wonderful afternoon. Have a wonderful day. If you ever need any advice or if you ever have a question, we give free advice, free of, of expectation. Uh, as well as free of charge. But to me, the first one, I think, is the more important one when it comes to giving out advice. So if you ever need some help on anything, please feel free to reach out to us. Terrific, I will. Thank you so much. Thank you. Once again, uh, Christina Coleman from Coleman Immigration today with us. Uh, I am Michael Renfro with Gladiator Law Marketing. Uh, this is 15 Minutes Share Your Voice, and that is brought to you by Gladiator Law Marketing. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Until we see you the next time 
on the next episode. Same bat time, same bat channel. (laughs) Thanks for listening to 15 Minutes. Be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next time.